Hey, welcome back, everyone. We are now all on uh, Grokket's OGTV, uh, where we go through the official guide question by question and uh, give you the answers and explanations that you need where you get to see, uh, see instructors actually going through and doing the work, uh, writing down notes as you might. <clears throat> so last time we left off on page 25 of the official guide. And it's also question number 25. So we're beginning the data sufficiency portion of this first section. So remember, the answer choices are always the same for our data sufficiency questions. They're always, uh, the first one is that statement one is sufficient on its own. The second one is that statement two is sufficient on its own. The third one is that they are individually insufficient, but that together they are sufficient. The fourth one is that either one is sufficient on its own. And then the fifth answer choice is that neither answer choice is sufficient on its own, and even in conjunction, the two of them are insufficient. <clears throat> you always want to have those um, answer choices memorized. So number 25. If the unit's di digit of integer n is greater than 2, what is the unit's digit of n? So to know this, it's always a good idea to do a little bit of prediction before you actually tackle the, the statements to try and determine whether you can figure out anything about what would be sufficient so that maybe you can recognize it when you see it in the sentence. In this particular case though we really just need to know what integer n is uh, to be able to answer what the question is about the units digit. Remember that um, when we're talking about numbers every place before and after the decimal has its own name so um, you know a lot of them are easy to remember so you know the uh, the tens digit is in the you know the the tens place. The hundreds is where you would put the number of hundreds that you have. The ones is sometimes called the units digit, so that's this one, the one immediately to the left of the decimal point. And then on the other side we have tenths and hundredths, etc. So this is the digit we're after. So let's tackle the statements one at a time. Um, you can either do them in order or sometimes uh, you can go with the easier one first because that allows you to eliminate a number of answer choices either way. Statement one it says the unit's digit of n is the same as the unit's digit of n squared. Well, so that's interesting. What it means is that the unit's digit does not change when n is squared. So we know that uh, from the original statement that the uh, unit's digit is of n is greater than 2, which means it needs to be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. So which of these is the same when squared? Well, 3 when squared is 9. 4, 16, 5 is 25, that's a winner, 6 is 36, 7 is 49, 8 is 64, and 9 is 81. So uh, what, tr what, ant what statement 1 tells us is that the unit's digit of, of our integer n is either 5 or 6. However, we need to know the exact value. More than one value is not, is not sufficient. So statement one on its own is insufficient. Statement two tells us that the unit's digit of n is the same as the unit's digit of n cubed. So again, using these same numbers, uh, we can actually just still use this, um, we have to figure out what, whether the, digits, uh, the unit's digit changes when we cube the number. So, uh, 3 cubed is 27, 3 times 9, 4 times 16 is 64, so that one's tempting. Um, 5 ends up being 625, so this one's also tempting. Um, 6 comes out to be another big number, 256. Or no, not 256. Anyway, uh, the the, uh, the unit's digit ends up ending in six. When, when you're doing uh, multiplication, remember that when you know, no matter how many numbers you're multiplying times each other, um, the unit's digit is only affected by this first order of multiplication. So uh, any consecutive uh, digits in the number. Any consecutive places don't actually add anything to whatever the unit's digit ends up being. It goes straight through. So we really only have to compute the first digit. 6 times 36. It's going to end in 6. 7 times 9 is not going to end in 7. Um, 8 times 4 is not going to end in 
8 and 9 times. 9 is actually going to get us there. That gets us uh, 729. So 9 is a possibility. So in this case, we found out that it was 4, 5, 6, or 9, which again is still insufficient for, for purposes of determining the units digit of integer n. The two statements in conjunction then, uh, so we could cross off statement 1 after the first one as well as either. Um, we could cross off statement 2 as, as a result of looking at statement 2. So now we need to determine whether together these two statements are sufficient. Um, now again, we still need a single value for the units digit of n. And when you have more than one value, I mean, we look at how the two sets overlap, we still have two possible answers. So it cannot be sufficient, even in conjunction, because we still have the possibility of it being 5 or 6. So we are left with neither statement on its own is sufficient, and even in conjunction, the two are insufficient. Okay, get rid of this. And on to question 26, also on page 25. Again, our answer choices are over here. So what is the value of the integer p? So for this one, of course, there's very little prediction. We actually just need something to tell us about the value of integer p. Statement 1 tells us that each of the integers 2, 3, and 5 is a factor of p. However, um, we actually need to know what all of the factors are of p. In fact, we really still need to know what p is entirely. So um, these are, since 2, 3, and 5 are not necessarily the only uh, factors of p, this is in no way sufficient. We can cross off answer choice 1 immediately, as well as the, the idea of either statement being sufficient. We've already improved our odds of guessing to 1 and 3 if statement 2 proves to be impossible. Let's hope it doesn't. Statement 2 says, each of the integers 2, 5, and 7 is a factor of p, which is potentially useful. Um, but even still, this is not a list of a comprehensive list of the factors of p. So without knowing that, uh, we can't tell anything about p. So statement 2 also insufficient on its own. We can cross off number 2. All we are left with are the two um, answer choices, where the two answers are taken in conjunction. Even in conjunction, this list of factors of p, without the knowledge that it is a comprehensive list of the factors of p, uh, we aren't going to be able to determine the value of integer p. So even together, the two statements are insufficient. The fifth answer choice, neither one, even in combination. Okay, number 27 on page 25. If the length of Wanda's telephone call was rounded up to the nearest whole minute by her telephone company, then Wanda was charged for how many minutes for her telephone call? So for sufficiency on this one, we would actually need to know um, the total cost of her call and then the price per minute we could figure out, and then from those two uh, pieces of information, we could figure out how many minutes her telephone call was. And again, we have our answer choices. So the first statement is a straightforward thing. We find out um, that the total charge for Wanda's telephone call was 650. That was one of the two things that we were interested in for sufficiency, but we do also need to know the price per minute to determine whether or not what, how many minutes her call was. So statement one on its own, just giving us half of the, of the information we needed, is going to be insufficient. We can cross off choice one, as well as the either answer. So we've gotten it down to three just from statement one. Statement 2, again on its own, tells us that Wanda was charged 50 cents more for the first minute of the telephone call than for each minute after the first. Now, of course, that uh, allows for a number of different rates, and it also tells us nothing about the total cost of the telephone call. So 
statement two on its own also cannot be remotely sufficient. We're missing a lot of information. So we can cross off statement two from our possibilities. Now we have to consider the two of them together. We do have the total charge for Wanda's telephone call in statement one. And in statement two, we have the uh, kind of relative uh, charges per minute. However, even in conjunction, these two statements are not sufficient. We know that the total cost ends up is 650. We also know that the first minute is, or each, each minute after the first is a certain cost. And then we also know that it, the first minute is going to be x, that, that cost plus 50 cents. So if, if the cost is $1 per minute, then her first minute would have been 150. That gives us a very different number of minutes, or different enough, again, uh, than if the choice were two minutes, two dollars per minute, and then of course the first one would have been 250. So um, by changing the price per minute, and then of course the initial charge, we come up with different minute values for the length of her call. With uh, questions asking for a specific value, we need a single value for sufficiency. So even in conjunction, the two statements are insufficient for us to answer the question. The fifth one, neither answer choice is sufficient. Okay. Number 28 on page 25. Let me get our answer choices here. What is the perimeter of isosceles triangle MNP? I'll just draw a quick dry diagram here. Try and make it look more or less equilateral because it's an isosceles triangle, um, which means that uh, two of the sides are the same length and one of them will be a different length. Isosceles is Greek for equal legs. So um, two of the sides will have the same length, the opposite angles will have the same length, and then the third side will be um, you know, a different value, otherwise it would be an equilateral triangle. Um, so in order to know the perimeter, we need to know the lengths of the two similar legs and then the length of the different one. Statement one, then, tells us that mn equals 16. So that means this guy over here is 16. We don't know yet whether this is the side that has, that there's two sides with this this length, or whether this is the, the one side that's the different length. So statement one on its own is not going to be sufficient. Cross off number one, as well as either being sufficient on its own. Now, of course, we have to forget that statement one exists when we're doing our statement two. We don't do con the two in conjunction. That's one of the traps on the GMAT, actually, is uh, doing two of them in conjunction before you actually evaluate each of them on their own. The second one tells us that NP is 20. So we know that NP is 20, and the same issue arises. We know the value of this one side. We don't know whether this is the one that has a matching uh, side on you know, some other part of the triangle, or whether this is the one that there's only one with this side length. So on its own, statement two is also insufficient. We can cross off the statement two option. The two together, we have NP is 20, we have MN is 16. Um, it's an isosceles triangle, so MP needs to be either 16 or 20, so that it has two sides of equal length. But this is a value question. We need the actual perimeter of triangle MNP, and without knowing the length of that side, we don't actually know what the perimeter is. We'll get different values depending on whether it's 16 or 20. So even in conjunction, the two statements are insufficient. We can cross off together and are left with the fifth answer choice. Neither one on its own is sufficient, nor are they sufficient in conjunction. So number 29, also on page 25. Get our answer choices down. So 
So for number 29, it says, in a survey of retailers, what percent had purchased computers for business purposes? Really not a whole lot of prediction we can do on this one. We're just going to need something that gives us the number either outright or through process of elimination. Statement one tells us that 85% of the retailers surveyed who owned their own store had purchased computers for business purposes. So this certainly gives us part of the, the equation, but what we're after here is the total percent who had purchased computers for business purposes. From statement one, we find out that there's also a group of, of retailers who were surveyed who do not own their own store. So without knowing, th so that number in addition would give us the total percent as well as, as long as we had the, um, the total number of people surveyed. Um, but without that other side of the equation, um, we, we don't really have anything. So statement one on its own is going to be insufficient. We can cross off two answer choices right away. Always nice. Process of elimination is your friend on the GMAT. Statement two says that 40% of the retailers surveyed owned their own store. Now there's no way that this can give us efficiency because it doesn't even tell us anything about those who purchased computers for business purposes. So completely incomplete information is always going to be insufficient on its own. We can cross off choice two as an option. We need to consider the two together. So we know that 40% own their own store. We also know that 85% of those who own their own store purchased computers for business purposes. The original question, though, is asking us what percent, had, what percent of all retailers, not just those who, had, who, who own their own store, what percent of those had purchased computers for business purposes. Without that total picture, even these two statements together are not enough to give us sufficiency. So even together, the two are insufficient. We cross off together, and once again, neither one is sufficient, nor are they sufficient together. Okay, page 25, number 30. So the only gift certificates that a certain store sold yesterday were worth either $100 each or $10 each. If the store sold, sold a total of 20 gift certificates yesterday, how many gift certificates worth $10 each did the store sell yesterday? So here, in a way, we have um, an equation with two variables. Um, we know that there were 20 gift certificates t sold, and they were sold in two denominations. So we know that we can just say x is the $100 gift certificate number, and we can say y is the $10 gift certificate number. And we know that x plus y equals 20. But from there, that's still not enough to determine the actual numbers of them, because there's more than one value for x and y, um, you know, and we also don't know the total number of, or the total amount sold, so we don't have enough to figure out the value of y, which is the what we're after on this one. So it's time to tackle those statements. Let's take a look. So statement one, on its own, well actually let's do statement two first, because statement two is looks easier. It's shorter. It says, yesterday the store sold more than 15 gift certificates worth $100 each. Well, that's, that's good to know, but on its own, it doesn't give us enough information to determine the exact number. There's still more than one value um, to figure out, you know, what, what, how many they sold for why. They could have sold any, any, so if there's 20 total and they sold more than 15, uh, of the 100s, that means they sold 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20 of the of x. So x equals one of those things, which means then that y equals 4, 3, 2, 1, or 0. With more than one value, that's in no way going to be sufficient for us to be able to answer what is the value of y, which is what this question is actually asking. So uh, 20 gives us, narrows it down, or uh, statement 2 gives, uh, narrows it down for us, um, but it's not enough to determine the value of y. So statement 2 on its own is insufficient.
we can cross off two, and we can cross off either one being sufficient. Statement one is more interesting, and it gives us a little bit more to go on. It says the gift certificates sold by the store yesterday were worth a total of between $1,650, $1,650, and $1,800. So the total um, is between $1,650, $1,600, and 1800. Now let's see what this gives us because what this really is is telling us that the value of a whole separate equation is between these two numbers. Um, to determine the total value of the gift certificate sold we need to multiply the number of gift certificates sold at $100 uh, at the $100 rate times 100 add that to the number sold at $10. Um, so that's basically 100x plus 10y. That's the total dollar value of all gift certificates sold yesterday at this certain store. And we know that that equation fits in here, or that inequality basically. So let's actually see what that gives us. So we know then that um, 100x plus 10y is going to be greater than 1650. We also know the value of y from our other equation over here. So we can actually get it down to a single value. So uh, y is the same thing as 20 minus x. So we'll just do that up here. x plus y equals 20. Therefore, y equals 20 minus x. And we're choosing to solve um, for y here because we're only going to multiply it times 10. So that's going to make it easier. So uh, this is the same thing as 100x plus 10 times the quantity 20 minus x is greater than 1650 still. So 100x plus 200 minus 10x gives us that 1650. 90x is going to be greater than 1450. And if we decide, if we divide both sides by 90, which we can do with inequalities, and we don't have to flip the direction of the sign because we're dividing by a known positive number, x ends up being greater than 16.1. So the number of gift certificates sold is greater than 16.1. Um, it does still leave a range of values, but of course remember we don't sell partial gift certificates, so that means that x, the number of um, $100 gift certificates sold is either 17, 18, 19, or 20. However, we've also been told that there's an upper limit on the number of, on, on the total dollar value. So if there were 20 $100 gift certificates sold, we would be over the $1,800 total that we're after here. So whatever it is, uh, the number of um, $100 gift certificates cannot be more than $1,800. It can't even equal $1,800. So there can't have been 20 sold. That gives us more than $1,800. That gives us $2,000. If there were 19 $100 ones sold, that puts us at $1,900, which is not less than 18 If there were 18 sold, $1,800, 1800 um, is not less than 1800 So the number we're after here needs to be less than 1800 according to statement two. So it can't even be that there were 18 $100 gift certificates sold because of the information given in statement one, because the total dollar, total dollar value was less than 1800 That leaves us only the possibility of 17 um, $100 gift certificates being sold. If there were 17 of those sold, there were three of the $10 ones sold. That gives a, and of course we didn't actually have to do that math, but 20 minus 17 is almost too easy not to do in your head. We do have sufficiency then because we know that y equals 3, which is what we're after, so statement 1 on its own is sufficient. So still page 25, number 31. Get our answer choices up on the board. It 
So, is the standard deviation of the set of measurements, x sub 1, x sub 2, all the way to, so 20, 20 numbers in this set, um, is, this, is the standard deviation of the set of measurements less than 3? Standard deviation is one of those um, kind of interesting topics on the GMAT, where you really aren't going to have to compute it, or if you do, it'll be given in very simple terms. Um, most of the time, you just need to know whether you are able to compute it. Standard deviation is the measure of how far, on the average, each number in a set is from the average of the set. To put it another, another way, the further apart the numbers are in the set, the larger the standard deviation would be. So standard deviation, you find out the difference between each measurement um, and the mean. Um, and, then that, and then that actual number is squared, and then you find... Anyway, sorry, start over. Um, let's just say we uh, figure out we have a, a set that's like one, two, three. We figure out the distance uh, between each measurement and the mean. In this case, the mean here is two. And then the distance from each of these, between the distance between one and two, two and two, and three and two, each of those is squared. They're added all together and averaged together, and then we take the positive square root of that average. That is the standard deviation. The average itself is what's called the variance. So um, the square root of the variance um, is what gives us standard deviation. Okay, so to, in order to determine the standard deviation of the, we need to determine whether, you know, the standard deviation is less than three. We need to know something about the numbers in the set or those individual components, um, the average distance between each set, between each number in the set and the mean, or the actual variance, which is the average of that distance, of, of those squared distances. So statement one on its own first. So it says the variance for the set of measurements is four. Remember that the variance is the average of the squares of the distances from each number to the average. So it's a number that still has to have its square root taken. Of course, if we're given a number like 4 for the variance, the square root of 4 is pretty easy to compute, or should be for you on the GMAT, so it's going to be 2. We shouldn't actually have to calculate it, we just know that we could calculate it. No matter what the number had been given, if it had said the variance for the set of measurements is 5,283, um, we still would be able to determine the standard deviation because we know we could take the square root of that number. As it happens, we don't have to, so statement one on its own is sufficient on its own, which means we can cross off number two that says statement two is sufficient on its own, as well as the option that neither and together, because both the together and neither involve both of them being insufficient on their own. Statement one is sufficient. So now we're left with a choice between either statement one being sufficient or either one being sufficient. Statement two tells us for each measurement, the difference between the mean and that measurement is two. In this particular case, then, uh, this actually ends up being the same thing as the standard deviation, but even if, even if it didn't end up being such an easy number to compute, we would know that the average distance here could then be squared, take the average of it, uh, or take the, take this distance, add add the squares of them all together, find out the average of those numbers, and then take the positive square root of that. That would be the standard deviation. Now, since the the distance between each of the numbers is the same, even before we do all that squaring and everything else, um, the standard deviation would be the same as this number. So, statement two on its own is sufficient for us to determine what the standard deviation is, and that it is less than three. So it's actually sufficient, yes, in both cases. We know that um, in both cases it is going to be two. Either one sufficient on its own. All right, page 25. Number 32. Is the range of the integers 6, 3, y, 4, 5, and x greater than 9? So when you're given questions like this on the GMAT, 
um, one of the first questions like this that involve a set of numbers, one of the first things you should always do is rewrite the, the set of numbers in chronological order, in ascending chronological order. So we have 3, 4, 5, 6. X and Y you can put anywhere um, because we don't actually know their values. So for this one it's asking whether the range is greater than 9. Remember that the range is the distance or the difference between the largest number in the set and the smallest number in the set. So um, in this case, without knowing the values of x and y, um, we can't determine it. Right now, the smallest number in the set is 3. So if x or y is greater than 12, that would be true. Or um, if either x or y takes us below 3, then that then we wouldn't need the other one to be bigger. Oh, so, so if either x or y is also very negative, that could put us um, with, a, with a range greater than 9. In any case, we need to know the values of x or y um, to determine whether, we, uh, whether the range is greater than 9. So statement 1 on its own, y is greater than 3x. Well, um, that certainly gives us relative values, but there's more than one value for y and x that we can plug into this that, that change the, the answer. Um, this is a yes-no question, so we need the answer to be always yes or always no. Um, that the range is always greater than 9 or always not greater than 9 for sufficiency. Um, sometimes yes and sometimes no is insufficient. With a value where, with x equals 1, so if x equals 1 and y is greater than 3x, that still gives us a huge range of values, um, anywhere from 3 to 33 million um, or, or beyond. So without putting constraints on the value of y in this case, or on x really for that matter, but really in particular on y, um, we don't have any idea what the difference is uh, or what effect these values have on the set. So statement one on its own is insufficient. We can cross off this one as well as this answer choice. Statement two tells us that x is between uh, y and three. So y is greater than x and, y and x is greater than three. Again, um, this does limit the value of x a little bit better, but it still doesn't limit the value of y. And again, if we pick a value like 1, uh, well, in this case, we would need to pick a value like 4 for x. So if x is 4, y could be anything from 5 to 5 million. If y is 5, the range of the set is not greater than 9. If y is 5 million, the range of the set is absolutely greater than 9. Uh, so without putting any kind of boundaries on um, on the values here, we, we actually still don't have sufficiency. Insufficient for us to tell anything. So again, now we're left with together and neither as our options, so we need to look at the two statements in conjunction. Now in this case, we still don't have a an upper bound for the value of y, but we have a little bit more of a, con a constricted um, basis for figuring out the value of x. We know that x is greater than 3, from statement 2. So let's just say that x is 4. This is the lowest possible value for the range of y. We also know then that y is greater than 3 times the value of x. So 3 times the value of x is 12. So y must be greater than that. y is greater than 12. The smallest number in the set is now 3, and the largest number in the set, y, um, so it's 3, do, 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 and then y is greater than 12. In this particular case, if y equaled 12, the range of the set would be 9, because the difference between 3 and 12 is 9. Since we know that y is greater than 12, the range of the set must be greater than 9, again, without, having, without even knowing necessarily what um, x and y are. Um, x can be any number greater than 3, and as x gets bigger, y in turn gets that much bigger, and the range of the set also increases, but never uh, changing the sufficiency of the two statements together. So it's sufficient to tell us, yes, the range of the set is greater than 9. So together, the two statements are sufficient. Okay. Number 33 on page 25.
again, we get our answer choices on the board. So is 5 to the quantity uh, x plus 2 over 25 greater than 1? It's a good question. Um, in this particular case, basically, in order for the, oh, excuse me, less than 1. Uh, that totally changes the problem. Um, is it less than 1? That's a, so in order to determine sufficiency on this one, we need to know basically what the value of x is or what the value of 5 to the x plus 2 is relative to 25. In this particular case, in order for that quantity, that whole fraction on the left-hand side, in order for that to be less than 1, 5 to the x plus 2 itself needs to be less than 25. Uh, but without knowing what the statements are, it's not going to be enough for us to determine sufficiency or really make too many predictions. Just know that we're looking for making um, that thing on the left either definitely a fraction less than 1 or definitely a fraction greater than 1 because we need always yes or always no for sufficiency. So statement 1 tells us that 5 to the x is less than 1. This calls for then for a little simplification and a little bit of um, magic with exponents. So the original one tells us that 5 to the x plus 2 over 25 is less than 1. Remember from the properties of exponents, though, that um, if you have x to the a times x to the b, things with the same base but different exponents, that's the same thing as um, x to the a plus b. And so you can fool around with that both ways. This means in this particular case that then 5 to the x plus 2 is the same thing as 5 to the x times 5 squared over 25 being less than 1. 5 squared, of course, is 25, so we can actually just cross off the numerator and the denominator of this one. That tells us that 5 to the x is less than 1, which is actually exactly the same thing as what statement 1 says. So the original question is asking us, in a simplified form, is 5 to the x less than 1? Statement 1 tells us, yes, 5 to the x is less than 1. So statement 1, on its own, totally sufficient to answer the question. We can cross off the option of 2 being correct by itself, as well as um, the options of together and neither. We have a 50% chance of getting this one right, and all we did was solve one thing. Let's take a look at statement 2. Statement 2 tells us that x is less than 0. So in this particular case, we know then that in this original we can go back to our original thing here. Um, if x is less than 0, we also know that whatever it is, x plus 2 is going to be um, less than 0 plus 2. So it's going to be something less than 5 squared in the numerator. It's going to be, you know, let's just call it, you know, number 2. <laughs> number 2 is going to be um, something l less than 5 squared over 25. So whatever this is, um, whatever is in the numerator, it's going to give us a number that it's going to be less than 5 squared, it's going to be less than 25, it's going to be less than 25 over 25. Therefore, the fraction itself will be less than 1. So statement 2 is also sufficient. You can cross off either one, or sorry, cross off number 1, and it is the fourth one. Either one is sufficient on its own. Okay, so page 25, number 34. So of the companies surveyed about the skills they required in prospective employees, 20% required both computer skills and writing skills. What percent of the companies surveyed required neither computer skills nor writing skills? So this one's clearly going to be one of our one of our overlapping set problems. It's always helpful to write this out in the Venn diagram form um, to keep track of what's what. And remember that the total is always going to be um, number one plus number two minus those that are both plus those that are neither equals the total. So 
And we know from the original uh, statement that 20% required both computer and writing. So we'll call this computer, we'll call this writing, and there's 20% that require both. We also know then that the, uh, so we know a couple of these already. Uh, we don't know, we know it's 1 plus 2 um, minus 20 plus neither equals 100 because these are percentages, not actual numbers. Then the question is asking us what percent of the company surveyed required neither computer skills nor writing skills. So this guy here, neither, is the one that we're after. We need to figure out um, the value of 1 and the value of 2 in order to get sufficiency. So uh, statement 1 on its own um, tells us that of those companies surveyed that required computer skills, half required writing skills. So what it tells us here, um, statement one, is that whatever's, whatever is here, half of that is the, is the number that also required writing skills. So that, to put it another way, the number that requires, uh, of the total number in this circle, half of them required writing skills and half of them did not. So that means that this number must also be 20. So that gives us the, uh, the value in circle number 1. But remember, we also need circle number 2 in order to solve for the neither value. So statement 1 on its own, while useful, is not sufficient. We can cross off statement 1 on its own being sufficient as well as either one. And we have to undo what we just did because you know we don't know that anymore when we're evaluating statement 2 on its own. We do still have the 20 in the middle, though, because of the original uh, question. Statement 2 tells us 45% of the companies surveyed required writing skills, but not computer skills. So what that tells us, it gives us the value of the, t of the total circle, or excuse me, the circle um, minus the 20. So writing only. So statement 2 gives us the percentage that are writing only, not the part that was overlapped. So here we have the value of, of circle 2, um, but not the value of circle 1. And so, of course, that's going to be insufficient on its own. So we can cross off statement 2. We're left with just together or neither. Now, the two together, actually, it looks pretty tempting because we had a, a lot of numbers written here. Um, and so ultimately, what we know then is there were 40 here because there were 20 here and there are 45 in the only so um, circle 1 plus circle 2 circle 1 in this case is going to be 40 circle 2 is actually the number that were only writing skills plus those that were computer skills minus both plus neither I don't know why I made that note but anyway so without even doing the rest of the math, we know that with just a single variable and this arithmetic expression, we can figure out how many uh, required neither computer skills nor writing skills. The two statements together are sufficient. Choice C, the two statements together are sufficient. So number 35 on page 25. What is the value of W plus Q? Um, so for sufficiency, again, without looking at the statements, we either need the value of W and Q respectively or the combined value of W plus Q. Because remember, um, in order to find W plus Q, you don't necessarily need the individuals, uh, the individual elements, the individual variables, if the question is willing to simply give you the sum, which is what the question is asking for. So, statement one, we get 3W equals 3 minus 3Q. It's promising, of course, because it has both variables in it. Um, if we actually add 3q to both sides, we get 3w plus 3q equals 3. And divide the whole thing by 3, we get w plus q equals 1. Um, in this particular case, we were actually asked what the value of w plus q is. So statement 1 on its own is definitely sufficient. We can cross off statement 2 on its own, as well as um, 
the together and neither options. 50% chance of getting it right already. So the third one, excuse me, second one, I don't know why, there's not, th there's not three ever. Um, we have 5w plus 5q equals 5. This one's even more straightforward. We divide all the elements by 5. We are left again with w plus q equals 1, which is sufficient, and in fact it should match the value here. So this one is sufficient on its on its own. The trap here, of course, is that the question is asking for two variables. And so if you have drilled into your head this notion of when you have two variables, you need two equations, you would immediately jump to the notion of, well, you know, there's an equation in statement one and an equation in statement two. Those two things together would be sufficient. In this case, though, reduction of the expressions in each of the statements gives you sufficiency on its own. So don't fall into that trap of jumping in um, immediately and assuming that two equations plus two variables always need, requires two statements. Sometimes one is enough, especially when you're given, when you're being asked about the value of um, a combination of variables as opposed to just one variable. So in this case, either one is sufficient. Answer choice number four. All right, number 36 on page 25. Get our answers on the board. If x and y are points in a plane and x lies inside the circle C with center O and radius 2, does y lie inside circle C? We'll draw our buddy circle C here center O, and we know that X and Y are points in the plane and X lies inside circle C. So does Y also lie inside circle C? A good question. Statement 1. The length of the line segment XY is 3. So keep in mind of course that this circle has a radius of 2. So the distance from center O to any point on the circle is going to be 2. The length of line segment XY is 3. This means that, that the diameter of the circle is going to be 4 because it's you know the two radii end to end. It is possible in multiple places to put a line that is 3, that is 3 units long, um, inside a circle that has a diameter of 4. So you know it could be you know here or here. There's a bunch of different places that you, in fact, probably an infinite number of places that you can put a line that is has a length of three, um, but a in a circle that has a diameter of four. So statement one on its own, without knowing where y is, um, y could certainly be out here, and it could also fit within the circle. So that is insufficient for us to determine whether y lies inside circle C. So we can cross off statement one as well as either. And draw a new circle since that one's looking a little ragged. We know that x is here or somewhere. So statement two tells us that the length of line segment OY is 1.5. So remember that the radius of circle C is two which means that the distance from the center to any point on the circle is 2. If the distance to point y is less than 2, y must be within the circle. No matter where we put a distance of 1.5 here, if y is over there or over there or over there, no matter what, this line segment is not going to extend beyond the confines of the circle. So y must be somewhere within the circle and therefore x, y, you know, could be any of these things, but we know for a fact that y must be in the circle, so statement two is sufficient on its own to answer the question. Still on page 25, number 37.
is x greater than y? Not a whole lot of prediction we can do on that one. Uh, we need to know the values of x and y, or a statement that gives us that equation or that inequality straight up as, as telling us that x is greater than y. Statement one on its own. Um, x equals y plus 2. Well, um, if x, so in this particular case, this basically tells us that no matter what um, x is, you have to add 2 to y in order for them to be equal. This means that x must be bigger than y. Um, in fact, it's 2 bigger than y. So this basically gives it away. It tells us that x is in fact greater than y, and it is sufficient on its own. So we, we know that uh, it could be statement 1, can't be statement 2, can't be together and it can't be neither because both of those require them to be sufficient, insufficient on their own. So it's either uh, 1 or 4. Statement 2, x divided by 2 equals y minus 1. So they give us something a little bit more complicated here. Um, we can multiply both sides times 2 to simplify the equation a little bit. So we get um, x equals 2y minus 2 which looks like it might be sufficient but there's several different values that we can pick for y and they don't all equal they don't all give us sufficiency in terms of whether x in terms of x's relationship with y um, when you're given things like this where you have to multiply and divide um, uh, it's very good to test uh, positive and negative numbers and sometimes zero in order to make sure that there's not some kind of trick here so if for example we um, say that y equals 3 so make a little table here so if y is 3 2 y minus 2 it's going to be 6 minus 2 is 4 in this case with y equals 3 x is greater than y if we pick a different number though um, and pick let's say negative 1 2 times negative 1 is negative 2 uh, minus another 2 ends up x equals ends up being minus 4 in this case y is greater than x so depending on the value of y x is greater than y, x is less than y. Depending on the value of y with statement 2, um, the answer is yes or no, and that's never sufficient for a yes-no question, because the question was, is x greater than y? Statement 2 is not sufficient to tell us. So it is, in fact, then, choice A, statement 1, on its own, is sufficient. All right, on to page 26, number 38. So if Paula drove the distance from her home to her college at an average speed that was greater than 70 kilometers or kilometers, depending on where you're from, um, per hour, did it take her less than three hours to drive this distance? So basically, we definitely need to know something about the total distance, because you'll remember, um, after we get our answers up there that uh, this is a very useful formula on the GMAT distance equals rate times time in this particular case we're trying to solve for t so we actually know then we can you know divide both sides by um, by by r we end up with t equals the distance divided by the rate but we don't have all three of those elements we're only given two in the question so we are going to have to rely on the statements to fill in the blanks Statement 1. The distance that Paula drove from her home to her college was greater than 200 kilometers or kilometers. Um, so we know that D is greater than 200. We also know that the rate is at least, or well, it's greater than 70 kph. Um, but for the purposes of this, we can figure out the absolute minimum value and go from there rather than trying to do this with two inequalities going at the same time. So we know then that um, the time is going to equal, or time is going to be greater than 200 divided by 70, which is the, the, the sort of rock bottom uh, minimum that isn't included in her rate. When we simplify this, it's 20 divided by 7. In order for um, her to 
get done in less than three hours, this number would have needed to be 210 over 70. So the fact that it's less, in fact, it comes out to be uh, something like what, 2 and 6 sevenths. Get rid of that, 2 and 6 sevenths, which is um, less than 3. So we know that the time that she took is greater than 2 and 6 sevenths. Um, and she would have had to have gone um, a distance of at least uh, 210 kilometers to actually um, make the answer no. In this particular case, though, since the time is greater than 2 and 6 sevenths, there are numbers that are both greater and less than 3 that still satisfy that inequality. So um, the range of values could be anything between, you know, 2 and, you know, whatever, 98 one hundredths, all the way to 4, you know, or, or even more. Because we have some values that are less than 3, some values that are greater than 3, and in fact we could even have a value that equals 3, statement 1 on its own is insufficient to tell us, you know, anything really about how long it took her. So we can't, can't be statement 1 on its own. It also can't be either statement on its own. Statement 2, the distance that Paula drove from her home to her college was less than 205 kilometers. Remember what we said before, um, that if, if, if it were just a straight out 210 divided by 70, that would exactly equal 3. Um, in this particular case, we know that she drove even, we drove, she drove a shorter distance than 210, it's 205, and we also know that she drove a, at a speed greater than 70 kph, so it's actually greater than 70 here. So if, oh, 30, geez, three hours. Um, so if she had driven 210 at 70, that would take three hours. If she drove a, a shorter distance at a faster speed, it is guaranteed to be less than three hours. Therefore, statement two on its own is entirely sufficient to answer the question. Choice B. Okay. I think we'll stop there to make sure we get done in time. Thank you all for coming and listening to this particular broadcast of Grokket's OGTV. My name is Jim Jacobson. I'm one of Grokket's tutors. Next time we'll pick up